Hi, this is Steve Yee, Director of Product Management for SQL Azure. In this walkthrough, we'll look at working with SQL Azure Database using .NET code to create a web application. We'll look specifically at connecting to SQL Azure Database using the Entity Framework Data Access Framework, and we'll build a simple website to access our data. Although we'll focus on Entity Framework, the same techniques can be used when working with traditional ADO.NET. To build our website, we'll take advantage of the ASP.NET MEC3 project template for Visual Studio. This template provides scaffolding to help us rapidly produce a website, which will allow us to easily view and edit the data in our database. You can choose to run the web application within Windows Azure, on-premises, or with a hoster. There are many benefits to using SQL Azure Database. The top benefit of using our cloud database is the ease of administration high availability, failover, and the ability to extend the reach of data to synchronize with on-premises databases and make it available for web and mobile applications. When you move to SQL Azure Database, you ensure your data is always accessible with an SLA from Microsoft offering 99.9% .9 availability. Once the data is in the cloud, it can be accessed from almost anywhere in the world with ease and speed. These benefits help you meet goals that may have been more difficult, more costly, or even impossible to achieve before. In another walkthrough, we used Microsoft Access to track employee expense reports. We showed how to move the expense report data to SQL Azure Database while still maintaining the on-premises Access application. In this video, we'll show how to extend the usage of this expense report data and also make it accessible via a web application. While the example website will not contain all of the functionality of the Access application, it will clearly demonstrate the benefit of making the same data available to different applications. All right, let's get into some coding. I'll be working in Visual Web Developer 2010 Express. If you need to download this application, you can go to microsoft.com web and use the web platform installer to get a free copy. If you've already purchased a version of Visual Studio, you can go ahead and use that instead. I'll be using the latest version of ASP.NET MVC, which is MVC3. This is also a free download available via the web platform installer or via the link on your screen. From the file menu, select New Project. From the list at the left, I select Web under Visual C Sharp and choose ASP.NET MVC3 Web Application. For this demo, I am using C Sharp but all of the functionality can be accomplished with VisualBasic.net. You can choose a different location to save your work by selecting the Browse button. For now, I'll name my project ExpenseWeb and then select OK. Now I am asked to choose between an empty template and an Internet Application template. The Internet Application template will generate in an accounts control that uses forms authentication but I don't really need that now, so let's go ahead and select the empty template. Also, notice that I have the option to select a default view engine to tell the framework which type of style I prefer to view my files. MVC3 has a new view engine called Razor, which makes things really simple, so let's leave that selected, and then click OK. Razor provides a great new view engine option that is streamlined for code-focused templating. Okay, since we selected the empty template, we don't have any functionality here yet. Although a default layout and style sheet have been created for us. So let's add a page to our site that is based on the expense report data in our SQLizer database. Since this is MVC, we need to add a model, controllers, and views. Let's start with creating the entity model first, as both of our controllers and views will depend on it. To create our model representing data in the Expense database, I right-click on the Models folder, and under Add, I select New Item. In the list on the left, I select Data to filter the list to show data access options. I then select ADO.NET Entity Data Model. This is the main container file for the Entity Framework. I'll add my model Expense Model, and then press Add. The next dialog box shows different options for creating our data model. For now, I'll just use the default, which is to generate the model from an existing database. So I'll press Next. We are now presented with an option to create a connection to our database. 
Since this is the first time I'm connecting to the data, I'll press New Connection. In this next dialog box, I need to fill in the information that will allow me to connect to my SQL Azure database. This information can be obtained from the Windows Azure portal. Be sure to use SQL Server authentication and correctly input your login information. We'll also need to specify the database name. In this example, my database name is Expenses, so let's enter that. Once this information is populated, it's generally a good idea to click Test Connection to ensure a connection can be established to the database. Great, we can connect to the database, so let's press OK. Next, we're taken back to the dialog box for connection information. Choose Yes, include the sensitive data in the connection string for this particular example we're working on now. For production systems, you may want to encrypt the connection string in the config file or write code to set the connection information. For now though, we'll just store our password in our config file. We now press Next. The system then queries our database and brings back information on its structure. At this point, you can go through and pick and choose which tables, views, or procedures to bring in. Our database is pretty straightforward, so I'll simply select the Tables checkbox to move all tables and press Finish. After creating the model, the system is going to generate code for us including a diagram of our data. As you can see, it correctly found the foreign key references between the Expense Report table and the Expense Details table. In essence, the system generated c -sharp classes that represent the tables within the system. Also, the Entity Framework provides us with a context that we will use to connect to our database in the cloud and query information. It's important to note that the steps we just followed to create this model are exactly the same steps we would have taken if we were working with an on-premises SQL Server database. When you start using SQL Azure, you'll notice that the only real difference will be with the connection details. Now, let's move on and add an MVC controller to list our expenses. The next thing I need to do is add a controller so that we can specify the data we want from our model and indicate which view to use. So let's do that. First, I'll right-click the Controllers folder and hover over Add. Then I'll select Controller. Now, I'll rename it Home Controller and I'll make sure to select the checkbox to add action methods for normal data access functionality. Also, I'll need to add a using statement, which allows me to use the model we created previously. Next, near the top of my class, I need to create a variable to hold the database context. The context is a wrapper around my database connection. It provides the access my code needs to the database. The context also enables the Entity Framework to automatically provide the translation between the objects that were generated and the underlying data. I then scroll down to the index method and modify the code to bring back all of the expenses. With that simple line of code, the Entity Framework will manage connecting to SQL Azure, querying the Expense Reports table, and returning the results as a list of Expense Report objects. Each object will be populated with the data from the database. In order for the view to be able to use this data, we need to pass it in. We simply feed it to the view method below. The view will then be able to loop over that list and display whatever it needs to. So let's compile our project to make sure our code works. If we tried to run our application now, it would fail because we haven't created the view yet. So let's do that now. To add the view, we right-click anywhere within the index method and select Add View. In the dialog that comes up, it already correctly named our view and defaults to the Razor View engine, which we'll use. To show a list of expenses, we want to create a strongly typed view. So we check that box, and in the Data Class dropdown, we select Expense Report Expense Web Models. For the Scaffold template, we want to select the List template. We'll use a shared layout or master page, but we'll leave this blank to accept the default Razor layout. We then press Add. Again, the system will generate some code for us. This is part of the scaffolding support built into MVC. It automatically inspects the data class we're working with and generates a default view for us. Notice the syntax of the markup in our view is really simple and concise, thanks to the Razor engine. So let's press F5 to debug and see what we have so far. 
While not yet very pretty, we can see that we already have a functional list of information on our expense data. All of this data came from SQL Azure database in the cloud, and it only took about five minutes to get started. Okay, now I'm going to move on and show you how we can use the rest of the basic editing features in MVC. Back in our home controller, I can scroll down and find the details method. I'll add some code to query our expense model for a particular expense ID and pass it to the view to view the details of one specific expense record. Again, I can right-click this section of the code and add a view. This time, I select Details for the scaffold template. Now, we move back to the home controller again, and this time we look for the create method. You will notice that there are two of them. One is marked with an HTTP POST attribute. MVC separates the request for a page or a GET from the POST of a page. In essence, one returns the view the user sees and the other processes the results of the view when the user submits the page. We don't need to change the code for the first create method, but we do need to create the view. So right click on the create code and select add view. This time we're going to select create for our view content. As before, the view is created for us. Again, the razor syntax is nice and clean and makes the layout easy to read. So let's hit F5 again to see how it looks. Just click the create link when the app comes up. Not too bad, and we also have some validation based on the model that was created for us. Now that the view is good to go, we can switch back to the home controller and the post version of the create method. We want to modify the post back logic to receive our expense report class and then validate to make sure that it's correctly populated. MVC will automatically take care of certain easy validations for us, like required fields. We do this by adding some code to check to see if the model, the expense report object in this case, is valid. Once we know the model is valid, we need to save it back to the database. And that's all we need to do for insertion of new expenses. Let's go back to our home controller once again, where we can perform similar work for edit functionality on a particular expense record. This time, the edit method does need some small modification by querying the specific expense report we want to edit. This is the same code we used for the details method earlier. Again, we add a view, making sure to select edit as our scaffold template. And once again, the view is created for us. We can press F5 to run the app and then click Edit to see this layout. It's not bad. We can improve the layout, but this works for now. So let's go back to the HTTP POST version of the edit method in the controller to process the results from this form. After verifying that the model state is OK, we need to find the original expense report object. The reason we need to do this is because Entity Framework allows working in a disconnected state with the object it generates. The object that is being passed to the method didn't come from the database, so we need to copy its fields over from the original data. You can do this with a handy method provided called apply current values. And with that, the editing functionality is complete. Back in our home controller, we can locate the delete methods. You might be surprised that delete is done in a similar way as the other methods by first displaying a page and then post back of that page. The reason for this is that it is a bad security practice to allow data to be modified using a GET method over HTTP. We are forcing the system to go through a POST in order to remove data. We follow very similar steps as before. For those of you who want to skip over these steps, you can just use the code in this Visual Studio project, which is available for free download. Now that we have finished the delete, all of our basic CRUD operations are complete, and we should have a fairly workable website. So let's run our application and poke around a little. The first thing we see is the list we created earlier. The links to the left should now be working. Let's add a new expense by clicking Create New at the top. When we do, we're taken to our Create page. I can then fill in the information and click Create. Once we do, we're automatically taken back to the list and we can see our new row in the list. I can then click the details link to the left of the new row and see its details. Next, I'll click back to list and this time click the delete link next to our new row. 
As you can see, we get the delete confirmation page, and by pressing delete, we are then taken back to the list and our new row is gone. So at this point, we've created a very functional website in less than 20 minutes. I could spend some more time to clean up the views by adjusting the markup and playing around with style. Additionally, we would need to invest some more time for field validation when creating and editing expense records. But as you can see, working with SQL Azure Database with the Entity Framework becomes just about the easiest part of the site creation process, which allows me to focus on my site and the functionality I want to provide, rather than how to connect to my data. Working with the data in the cloud becomes a seamless process with very little effort. This concludes our walkthrough of working with SQL Azure Database using .NET to create a website. As part of this session, we looked at how to connect to SQL Azure Database using the Entity Framework, and then we built a simple website to access our data using ASP.NET MVC. Thanks for watching, and please visit SQLAzure.com for the latest information and resources. To learn more about web development with ASP.NET, visit www.asp.net. Thanks.